little melody whenever it comes in would be nice on a real sort of fuzzy sound rather than just driven, you know? Uh, yeah. Or maybe something to try, or we could add it to what you've done as well. That's cool, there's I think maybe one chord in that last bridge. Sounds really good though, do you want to do another one? When I listen to a record, and I remember as a teenager listening to records, I'd go to bed with my headphones on every night and just try and dissect and understand what was happening in those records. The magic that would inspire me to want to do this is hearing things that sound great and you can't figure out how, how or why or what's going on. And when you hear those things in a mix that are just beautiful, wonderful sounds, and they're just not weird, but you just don't know how it's happening. How is that happening? It's, a, it's, it's an unusual technique. That's, that's where the magic comes in. And I think that's, that's kind of the, the holy grail, if you like, of a mix, is to find those things that are just, you can't put your finger on it, but it just makes it have a certain quality of its own. But right from the beginning, my interest in making music was largely about being able to add layers, add tracks. So I think whereas a lot of my friends would focus on learning their instrument first, from the very beginning, my instrument was kind of the studio that I could use these little boxes and uh, computers to record one instrument and then another one and, and have different instrumental parts interacting, which I suppose in a way is, is a really basic, simple, beginning of, of production or arranging music and that was it the seed had been sown some switch had gone on in my head and that was just all I was interested in all I wanted to do and it led on to me sort of uh, becoming more interested in the musical side of it and learning to play instruments as well as just the technical aspect but the technical side of it was there from right at the beginning it was the combination that fascinated me and I, I didn't really realize that this, this was what was happening then but I, I can see now that the exciting thing for me with music and music production is it's two different disciplines and philosophies you've got the very mathematical scientific technical side of it and then the completely emotion-led creative side of it and those two things have to work in harmony to get a really good result. Uh, and I love that, that you have this very structured, scientific, technical discipline, but you can bend the rules with creativity and come up with cool, interesting things. I think that the technical aspects of production need to be, and I think it's similar with when you play an instrument, the, the technique of playing the instrument needs, needs to be something that's so second nature and memorized that you don't have to think about it consciously necessarily because then you can allow yourself to be influenced creatively or emotionally by the song and um, so if I was starting a production with an artist the focus would be absolutely on um, what the song is made of what its structures like, where the dynamics are, what the emotion of the song is, what the um, what the picture is that the song is trying to create. A good song is made up of good writing, good playing, and a good feel and good interaction between musicians. And then after that, there's all the technical stuff, which makes it more aesthetically nice and um, polished and a sort of good sound that, that we're used to hearing on records. But the mixing side really starts <clears throat> with the arrangement of the music. If the music's badly arranged and you've got lots and lots of instruments all playing the same thing at the same time, or uh, there's no dynamics or whatever, you're not gonna be able to mix the song because the ingredients aren't already in a good balance. If all the musical ingredients are really nicely worked out and your musicians are really putting feeling into their performance and interacting with each other, then your job as a producer when it comes to the mix stage is much easier because you've already got something that's kind of really cool and great and you're just shining little spotlights on, on it and, and adding to it rather than trying to manufacture technically something that wasn't there in the first place. I definitely favour mixing on the console as opposed to mixing in the box. 
What you lose, I think, by mixing in the box is, first of all, the human element of the mix, because it's still an emotional thing at that stage. It, although it's a technical process, there's still an element of performance uh, and feel involved in the sound. You can, you can manipulate sound in a way that it adds to the emotional impact of the song and the music. As, as you go through the song, you might want to the band might be playing a big lift for a chorus or something, and you can help that with doing things sonically. And I think you can move faders on a desk in a way that with, with feel and musicality that is different to drawing a line of automation in the computer. It also gives you this little element of danger because you can always go wrong and you have to do your things on cue. And I like using outboard effects and throwing them into the mix live because you get that unpredictable quality, which you don't get from a, an in-the-box mix, where anything could happen, and sometimes things happen that you haven't predicted, and, and they're the best thing. They're the sort of moments of gold that you, you just couldn't create bit by bit on purpose. And the idea of, of manipulating things in real time as you're mixing a track in order to add dynamics and life uh, and actually make the sound a living, breathing thing is, uh, is very much a part of mixing on the desk. For example, on uh, John Pearson's album, Coal in the Soul, we've got this track, Pretty Polly, which is basically a murder ballad, and it's this vicious, mean kind of song, this incredible tale. Um, we had an interesting arrangement on the song with Liam Janocki on drums, Colin Gibson on bass, Jem playing his wailing harmonica through it. All so far, pretty standard kind of lineup. But we also had uh, Bill and Dave playing brass on there. We had trombones and trumpets and bass trombones. And what I wanted to get was at the end of each verse, there's this little turnaround um, and it comes back to the root note of the song, but the resolve, and it's this big, deep, low note. And I just wanted to get as many different textures that would play that turnaround and that big note as possible. So we recorded Dave playing these big rips on his trombone, that these gnarly, scary, low, fat noises. Um, also playing the, the two notes of the turnaround as well. Um, and then I had my guitar going through my orange fuzz pedal, which is just crazy fuzz, full on amps broken fuzz, playing similar lines and getting these sort of filtery effects from it. And the same thing with accordion. We have them all on different channels on the, on the board. Um, so that as each one of those turnarounds comes along, I could actually feel my way through it and bring the faders up and massage different elements out of the sound that are playing the same figure, but each time it's got a different character. And as the song gets more and more violent, so do the sounds on that turnaround. So it comes back to that root note and I'm just pushing the fader up a bit more and it's so powerful. You actually feel like you're in control of some big unwieldy monster that you're sort of like trying to ride through the song you know as you're mixing you you get that feeling coming back and that's what I mean when I say you're putting feeling and emotion into the sound as well as playing an instrument song came out really nice. We did lots of mixes just to get different uh, approaches to the performance. And the irony was we'd, I'd, I'd done lots and lots of different mixes and performances and we eventually opted for mix number 14, 
we'd done lots, and each one had something really good. There's a debt to the devil and well he must pay. There's a debt to the devil and well he must pay. For killing pretty Polly and running away. Willie and we were thinking, well maybe we'll edit a section of one mix into another one to get the best bits, but this one mix, mix number 14, seems to have it all, this dramatic scariness, and it was mixed on Valentine's Day as well. So Polly met her end on Valentine's Day on the 14th mix, so pretty nice. I think you want to be able to talk to uh, musicians and artists in the language that they understand which is the language of their song and the language of their instrument over the years i've learned to play quite a lot of different things out of necessity because i didn't always know um, musicians who played the instruments i wanted so i'd borrow an instrument or get an instrument learn to play it a bit but i think you you build up a sort of working knowledge of, of all kinds of different instruments so you can talk to a musician and say, um, you know, well, I really like what you're doing here on the bridge, but maybe try this voicing on the guitar, or try this inversion of the chord, and it'll sit better with the vocal or whatever. Um, and I think your artist is always going to feel much more comfortable and relaxed and trusting of you if they feel that you're on their side and you're, you're really, um, you understand what they're doing, rather than you're this faceless guy behind the glass with steel rim spectacles on barking commands through the talkback mic you know you really need to be down on the ground floor with the band almost an extra band member because it has to be that integrated for people to feel comfortable and for, for the the exchange to work not just musically but between um, humans as well it's a very person oriented thing I think the the it's a side of, of production that's more important than anything else is, is the ability to make people feel at ease and encourage them to give their best. My own experience of recording studios that I've been into in the past has been that they can be very clinical and very bland, very um, just flat in terms of character. And I don't like the idea of isolating everybody off and keeping them separate and segregated because it's unnatural and, and no band performs like that. When, when you're on stage, you're not all in separate little rooms. It's a unit. Everything acts together as a unit. Um, so I like to set the whole band up in a room with as little segregation as possible. Carefully choose the right mics and positions so that you get enough separation between your instruments and sounds to to get a good result but you don't want to get so much that everything is completely isolated because that little bit of bleed or uh, hearing one instrument in the mic of another instrument like uh, you've got the drummer playing in the corner there's going to be a little bit of drums in the bass amp mic and in the vocal mic but if it's the right amount you build up this really nice 3d picture from around the room and it all just sits in the background and gives this depth of field to the recording on a technical level you get this really nice deep broad rich image that's got some reality to it and on a musical level you've got musicians that are able to see each other talk to each other and play together in an interesting way um, and in an inspired way something that's always been important to me is, is depth perception in a mix front to back. We, we think of two speakers and getting left to right all of the time. And a lot of modern mixes are way up there in your face and everything is right up front and there's, there's sort of nothing, you can't see behind it because it's screaming right up there. Um, and that gets very fatiguing and difficult to listen to very quickly. And I also think that like anything, to have something up front you need something to compare it to. There needs to be something right at the back of the mix. And so sometimes it's nice to have those little elements that just sit way back, like at the back of the orchestra, just doing their little thing. Um, and it could be anything, a, an unusual effect or sound or something. 
But those things that are right back there, they're not to be drawn attention to, but they're to, to subtly enhance things and to give front to back perspective as well. You can't have something up front unless you've got something at the back and vice versa. And once you've got something right at the back, you've got all of this space you can, you can use. So the mix becomes more engaging and the sounds more engaging when you listen to it. And of course, all of that is again done to serve the emotion and the feeling of the song, not just to do clever sonic tricks. So in addition to, to mixing on the desk, I, I like to use uh, the outboard effects as well because for a lot of the same reasons, um, they give you a hands-on organic approach to changing the sound. And something I'm always trying to look for is to come up with sounds that are unusual, that maybe haven't been heard before, they've got an original quality about them, that are aesthetically pleasing and nice to the ear. So it's not just being weird for its own sake, but finding new cool ways of sounding good. My track, uh, Last Lonesome Mile, for example, there's what sounds like a uh, distorted electric guitar going all through the track, but it's not actually a guitar, it's a piano mic'd up through distortion and then there's some treatments, some echoes and things on it. And it gives the whole sound a, a quality you can't quite pinpoint. You know, that's a really cool guitar sound, but it, it's not normal. It's not a guitar, you get a different character to it. And that's a sound that is serving the song and giving it a nice, sonic identity, but it's coming from an unusual source. I don't believe in karma. For me, it's very important to help an artist to have their own sound. I think each record should have its own qualities and each artist is going to have certain characteristics that make their sound unique. And I think the role of producer should be to really get the most out of that and really, really focus in on, on what makes that artist unique and find ways of, of adding to that. So all of my little techniques and sounds that I've built up over the years, they're kind of like the, the colors on the palette. And so I can choose colors to apply to an artist's sound that will help paint their picture um, using a combination of my colors and new ones that we mix up for the artist. So I think while there might be an identifiable sort of sound to records I've worked on, I really like to think and strive um, for a result that's different and unique to each artist. I want them to sound like themselves, but through uh, a, com a combination of their tastes and mine and their ideas and, and, and mine. I tend to favor dynamic mics and ribbon mics because I, I like the, the way they sound. Dynamic mics are great because they really, really reject sound around them and focus on one very small point. So when you've got a whole band playing loudly in a room and you want to get a vocal sounding really good and up front, you have to use a dynamic mic because that's, that's going to be really directional. Whereas uh, mics that do have gorgeous qualities like the 44 or a valve mic, they're going to pick up all around so you're going you're to spoil your drum sound and get too much of everything else in into the vocal mic so um, when we make the live room which is a little uh, sort of live music performance show that we make where we invite bands to play in the live room we mic them up 
film them and make a nice show, get a really interesting, cool mix for them. Um, to really get the best out of the sound, we have to choose microphones that are going to give us a good balance of separation and bleed, so we've got that glue, and position them in the room in just the right way. And the room that I have here, the live room at Broad Oak, I've really worked to, to make it a performance space rather than um, this might be the laboratory in here in the control room where, where we do the science, but in there is where it's a performance space, so it needs to inspire creativity, make a band feel like they feel when they're, they're playing a concert on stage. So we've got colored lights and cool, vibey, settings everything's geared to make people feel as comfortable as possible so i had these headphone mixers built by uh, dave barnett local electrical wizard genius guy who makes brilliant things so everyone can have their own mix and have the most comfortable balance for them that all just helps to produce a good feel and to relax people and, and, and help them give their their best in the studio it's kind of like a big living room with, with stage lights. That's my idea. Ribbon mics I love because the, the warmth in the low end and mid range and the soft high end is, is, is just gorgeous. Particularly with drums, it'll stop cymbals from getting too trashy and edgy in the mix. They belong with the kit. I choose microphones because of a character that they have that, that is, is gonna enhance the, the subject matter. There's a lot to be said for mics that don't have their own character because sometimes you just want a really accurate picture of what you're recording. But I, I find nearly always I'm going for a, a character sound uh, and those characters build up and so eventually they become a whole picture full of different characters, which is a nice thing uh, rather than just having a one dimensional picture where everything has the same sort of sonic character. And I still think that there is something hard to define that happens when sound becomes electrons flying through wire and machinery and transformers and valves and transistors and miles of cable. Something's happening that's pleasing to our ears, um, which although software is very good now and tries to emulate those things, it's a bit like when you watch a movie that's had incredible beautiful detailed model making done it's all shot on gorgeous 35 mil film it's got this rich depth uh this sort of visceral quality to it and no matter how good the cg gets somehow there's something just unbelievable about it something a bit flat and a bit lifeless um and i think that's the same with recording it's this is 35 mil film the computer is cgi digicam Turning